gentlemen, may I introduce to you Jared L. Cohen, the eighth president of Carnegie Mellon University. We need to think better of ourselves if we expect the world to appreciate us for what we are. I believe strongly that 100 years from now, at the end of our second century, Carnegie Mellon will again be one of the most remarkable success stories in American higher education. And what we do from this day on, all of us working together, will help secure that destiny. I am privileged and deeply honored to be your president. Thank you very much. For those of you who I have not made friends with, I had the honor of being the Cones and the Donner family rabbi for many, many years. And so we begin. In the Jewish faith, we connect our lives to the teachings of our sacred text, the Torah. In the portion designated to be read this week, we find the following law. If you see your fellow Israelites, ox or sheep gone astray, do not ignore it. You must take it back to your peer. You shall do the same with that person's donkey. You shall do the same with that person's garment. And so, too, shall you do with anything you find of your fellow that he or she loses. You must not remain indifferent. This last phrase is significant. In Hebrew, the text reads, Lo hitalem, You must not hide. Subsequent Jewish law expanded this teaching to underscore our responsibilities to each other in almost every area of life. When it comes to the needs of those around us, we are not allowed to recuse ourselves. We must not hide. We don't declare a communal issue to be other people's business. We don't hide, at least we're not supposed to. And Dr. Jared Cohn did not hide. He understood this teaching in his marrow. He never hid from the challenges and problems of the world around him, in his neighborhood, our city, our county, our state, or our nation. Whether it was an issue of civil engineering or civic engagement, leading one of the premier research institutions in the world, or stepping forward with his daughter Hallie to create the Alumni Theater Company, giving significant support to Temple Sinai's renewal project, or teaching at our synagogue every Yom Kippur afternoon for years, Jerry Cohn never hid. He gave of himself unstintingly, and when Jerry did not have a particular skill in his toolkit, he found someone who did. With his abundant warmth and a smile to which you could not say no, Jerry did not let you hide. All of us have been blessed by Dr. Jerry Cohn's willingness to say yes, his refusal to hide from the challenges of modern life. He did not only give us the blessings of his life, he himself was a blessing to us all. O oh God of humanity, we pray that we keep alive the spirit of Dr. Jerry Cohn, the spirit that demands our engagement and connection to each other the spirit that demands we step forward and offer our gifts as he did, that rejects standing aloof from pain and problems and suffering. We, too, pray for the courage not to hide. If God answers our prayers, then part of him will live on through us. We will be blessings to each other and the world around us today and every day. This is our prayer. May the God of all of us grant it soon, speedily, and in our day. Please join me in welcoming Carnegie Mellon's 10th president, Dr. Farnam Jahania. Well, good evening. First of all, thank you, Rabbi Gibson, for that beautiful invocation and for your lovely words about Jerry. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the celebration of life for Dr. Jerry Cohen, who served as president of Carnegie Mellon from 1997 to 2013. Whether you're a faculty member, staff, alumni, or friend, and whether you're here in person in the Jared L. Cohen University Center or with us remotely. 
We're gathered today to celebrate and honor President Cohen's remarkable life and impact. And I would like to begin this afternoon by extending a warm welcome to the members of Cohen family. This includes Jerry's beloved wife, Bunny, daughter Haley and son-in-law Josh, grandson Solomon and Nate, and sister-in-law Sheila and many others. On behalf of the entire CMU community, once again, please accept our condolences for your loss. And thank you for sharing Jerry with us and for joining us and allowing us to celebrate his remarkable legacy today. I would also like to acknowledge my fellow program participants who will soon reflect on the many ways that Dr. Cohen impacted their lives. I also want to recognize all the leaders and community members from Pittsburgh and CMU who are here to pay their respect. We also have several of our CMU trustees with us, including our board chair, David Coulter, along with many distinguished members of the Pittsburgh community, too many to name, but we see you and we thank you for being here. Jerry, as all of you know, was the eighth president of Carnegie Mellon University. But he was also a nationally recognized and renowned engineer and thought leader. He was a teacher, a mentor, and a consummate family man. And as the program for this, in this evening indicates, he shaped lives and careers, as well as this institution and our region in so many ways. Scores of people have reached out to the university to share warm memories about Jerry, a clear and beautiful testament to just how deeply beloved Dr. Jerry Cohen was. These reflections, which we'll, we're collecting into a book for the family, have a common theme. People most often remark about Jerry's ability to connect with people, his heart. Make no mistake, far beyond this auditorium, whether, you support, whether he supported you as a mentor, advised you as a friend, or inspired you as a colleague, Jerry made an impression and a lasting impact. When we step back and think about Jerry's tenure as president, it was a uniquely consequential time for CMU and for the world. His presidency built on the technological advancements, institutional, institutional achievements, and interdisciplinary momentum of the late 1990s. President Cohen and members of the academic and administrative leadership who served with him skillfully leveraged the opportunities that emerged during the end of the 20th century to transform the university into a more globally recognized, interdisciplinary, and innovative institution. I do want to acknowledge and thank Mark Hamlet, who served as provost through Jerry's presidency and whose own story during these years is intertwined with the man we're here celebrating. Mark, thank you for all that you have done for our community over the years. Please rise to be recognized. <laughs> Simply put, Jerry had an uncanny ability to honor our history and culture, envision what's next, and then build on that future. Carnegie Mellon is the institution it is today, a world-renowned locus of unrelenting innovation, brilliant talent, and radical creativity because of Jerry's contributions as president. Today, you will hear many stories of groundbreaking projects that Jerry took on, ideas that he brought to life, and partnerships that he forged. But I want to just, just share a few, many, few, a few examples that I think perfectly summarize Jerry's impact on CMU and beyond. During his 16 years president, Carnegie Mellon grew by nearly every measure. 
we welcomed our machine learning department, our language technologies institute, what is now known as the Ray and Stephanie Lane Computational Biology Department, the Steinbrenner Institute for Environmental Education and Research, the Wilton E. Scott Institute for Energy Innovation, our Biomedical Engineering Department, and much more. Jerry also oversaw the expansion of CMU's international footprint. During his 10 year, he grew Carnegie Mellon from a national institution to a global university with degree granting programs in 14 countries. And he was a strategic, a strategic I should say, collaborator as we will hear from Mark Nordenberg, Chancellor Emeritus of the University of Pittsburgh. Jerry and Mark forged deep and transformative connections between CMU and Pitt that serve not only our region, but also the nation. Their close and enduring partnership gave rise to far-reaching community organization with a lasting impact. CMU's endowment grew significantly under Jerry's leadership nearly doubling to over a billion. During his time, our community's generosity and support included a record-breaking gift of 265 million from CMU trustee, Bill Dietrich. Beyond the endowment, our university expanded in other ways too. Our faculty count doubled, our spin-out activities doubled, and our sponsored research in life sciences nearly tripled. But Jerry's greatest passion at CMU, and you're going to hear about Jerry's work at CMU and beyond from other speakers, but I want to tell you, Jerry's greatest passion at CMU and throughout his life was teaching. He taught all of us, friends, colleagues, and most of all, students. With many facets to his job, Jerry was once asked to identify his favorite thing about being a president. Without a moment of hesitation, he answered enthusiastically, the students. And after he stepped out as president, Jerry continued to take great joy in teaching, a passion that he nurtured right up to his passing this last spring. Jerry came to work every day to do the work. And along the way, he helped to grow not just an extraordinary community, but an extraordinary university. The culmination of this growth positioned Carnegie Mellon and our region to be a global environment, a global powerhouse of innovation, creativity, and cross-disciplinary scholarship. It's a reputation that we proudly build on today. Equally important, Jerry and his many contributions to our region improved an untold number of lives across our entire community, across continents, and across generations. As I mentioned, we have several speakers who will share their reflections with you this afternoon. Our lineup feature includes university trustees and executives, faculty and alumni, along with Pittsburgh leaders and friends. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, David Shapira, who is an emeritus trustee and the emeritus chairman of Giant Eagle, as well as chairman of Shapira Foundation. As I'm sure most of you know, during Jerry's presidency, David served as chair of the board's board of trustees at CMU, and the two leaders worked very closely together. David, thank you for being here. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to David Shapira. Hello, everybody. Uh, I see I have a big problem because I have made some notes for myself about what I want to speak about, about Jerry, and Farnham already said them all. <laughs> uh, but uh, I do want to talk about Jerry from my point of view. And to start with, I also want to echo both Farman and the rabbi and my condolences to the family. Uh, 
Many of you wouldn't know this, but Jerry was one of my best friends. Uh, he and I got to know each other while he was here at CMU, and I was at first a trustee and then a chairman. And uh, he was just an absolutely wonderful man. But I, I thought that I would uh, talk about Jerry a little bit by talking about Carnegie Mellon, which I think is a wonderful, uh, marvelous example of how to uh, have an institution, change it, and grow it over time. Uh, I happened to grow up in Squirrel Hill, right across the park from uh, Carnegie Mellon. And uh, when I was growing up, Carnegie Mellon was considered to be a good school, but I wouldn't say it was considered to be a great school. And then along came first uh, Dick Seyert, who uh, decided he wanted to really change what Carnegie Mellon was. And despite the fact that we had very limited resources, uh, Dick decided, let's take what we have and concentrate it in a few areas and get really good at those and then grow from there. And uh, Dick set us on that path. Uh, I actually joined the board of trustees when Dick was still president, although it was right at the end, uh, and then succeeding presidents. But I think first, particularly Jerry, and now in the current time, Farnham, have taken that foundation and built it into something really unusual and really great. Uh, and in my own opinion, that has benefited every single person who is uh, associated with Carnegie Mellon. Because, uh, you know, we used to be associated with sort, I don't want to call it an ordinary place, but let's call it a slightly extraordinarily, extraordinary place. And now we're associated with a place that's literally beyond belief. And, of course, many of the people who are here, in order to honor Jerry, contributed to that. Uh, some of the things that make Carnegie Mellon so important uh, is, you know, Farnham referred to the doubling of the endowment, but... When you compare Carnegie Mellon's endowment to the big famous schools like the Ivy League, we have nothing, or at least we had nothing. We're starting to gain a little bit, but uh, so how did we do it? And I think what first Dick Sire did, and then Jerry, and now Farnham, uh, and I'm I'm not trying to discount the people in between. Uh, they instituted an entrepreneurial atmosphere here where basically the whole community got together and said, we can do this. We can make ourselves great. We can concentrate. We can get really good at something and we can make ourselves famous and great. And we did. And I mean, it's amazing. I remember one trustee meeting when we were all talking about uh, the need to raise a bigger endowment, which you can imagine we talk about at every trustee meeting. Uh, and it suddenly occurred to me that maybe having a small endowment was actually an asset, not a liability. And the reason it was an asset is because we had a bunch of people who worked together and who said, we can do this without a big, we can be entrepreneurs, we can, we can succeed without all the money behind us. And I mean, just look at the place, we did. I mean, it's amazing. And I think that that success uh, was greatly influenced by Jerry Cohen. Jerry believed we could do it. And as you saw in the little clip of him uh, that was shown before Farnham spoke, uh, he, he c communicated that. He believed it. 
He persuaded other people to do it. He used the bully pulpit of being the CEO to change this place. He also did some other things. Uh, and one of the things that he believed very strongly in uh, was diversity. And Jerry helped to change this organization from what it had been to a truly diverse organization. And I don't just mean by the color of the people who were here, or things like that. He changed it into an institution where people actually listened to each other and respected each other. And uh, I was talking to his son-in-law this morning about what I was going to say today. And, and he told me, I'd forgotten this actually, that Jerry, unlike what a president usually does, Jerry made himself the chairman of the diversity committee. And he used to talk about it at the board meetings. And he, he I mean, he was fabulous. Uh, he hired great people who were in line with the kind of philosophy that he had. And then if you read his book, which I have not yet seen, but I have a spy, which is his son-in-law, uh, he tells me that clearly in the book, it indicates that Jerry thinks that one of his great strengths was he hired this great staff and then he got out of their way and he let them do their thing. And I mean, Jerry was one of the most modest people I'd know. Uh, for a man of his renown and his success, uh, I hope he recognized how great he was, but you couldn't tell by talking to him. And I want to tell you just two stories about that. One is Jerry's job before he came here was the dean of the forestry school at Yale. And among other things, Jerry and I became golfing partners. And we used to go out and play golf together. And when I was a child, my father insisted that all of his children learn how to identify trees. So we could tell the trees by the bark and by the leaves and by the shape and by the seed structure and so on. And I can tell you this, Jerry might have been chairman of the forestry school at Yale, but he didn't know anything about trees. <laughs> the last thing I want to tell you uh, is a story that I actually did talk about at uh, his funeral. Uh, w while I was chairman, the university had a habit that we had to evaluate the president. And uh, so there was a committee that was formed to evaluate the president that we decided it had to be a really thorough evaluation. And there, I've forgotten now there were eight or 10 or maybe more people on the committee. And there was a list of 80 or 90 people that we went out and interviewed and asked them about Jerry. And these were, this was an incredibly diverse group. It was students, staff, faculty, community members, uh, larger community members from, you know, more than just Pittsburgh. And uh, when the committee came to me, because it was my job to tell Jerry the evaluation, the committee came to me and I said, well, what did you learn? And they said to me, we were not Sorry, I choke up about this. But we, they were not able to find a single person out of all those people who would say a single negative thing about Jerry. And I thought to myself, that's impossible. That everybody has fault. But, and maybe they were exaggerating. I don't know. But actually, I, know Jerry, I knew Jerry well enough to know that I suspect they actually weren't exaggerated. I think he was a man without fault. And uh, I want to just add one other thing because I know that Mark Nordenberg is going to be speaking. 
One of the things that used to exist in Pittsburgh is that Pitt and Carnegie Mellon were sort of enemies. And they competed with each other and they didn't talk. And uh, there was this enormous potential resources here of the two universities that was not being taken advantage of at all. But two wonderful things happened. One was Jerry came to CMU and Mark came to Pitt and the two of them said, this is crazy. Let's cooperate. Let's associate with each other. Let's take advantage of our strengths. And I think in the doing of that, that they not only changed the two universities, but they changed Pittsburgh. And uh, I think one of the things actually they should both be proud of, I'm sorry, Mark, but I'm supposed to be speaking about Jerry here, but I think they should both be uh, proud of is the difference that these two universities have made in Pittsburgh, in the United States, and in the world. So I'm going to close, but... I love Jerry Cove. I consider him one of the finest people I've ever met. I consider him one of the most accomplished people. Uh, Farnham was talking about how he taught people. He taught me like he taught everybody else. And I like to think I'm a better person because I've known him. Uh, so I'm going to stop there before I can't talk anymore. And it, and it. It's my privilege to introduce another long-term trustee, Don Johnson, who I've known for many years, who is an absolutely wonderful person and wonderful businessman and wonderful trustee. And uh, Todd, uh, please. Hello, everyone. I'd like to share a short story that involved really my first interactions with Jerry and really epitomized the characteristics of Jerry that I love so much. In a way, my relationship started with Jerry before I even knew him. What happened was in late 1995, the then president of Carnegie Mellon, Robert Morabian, asked me to head the Centennial Capital Campaign. I had only one question to Robert. Did he plan to be here for the whole campaign? He said yes, I said yes, and three months later he announced he was leaving. <laughs> uh, so that was my start, and we had to wait to really get this campaign going. Jerry then arrived on campus uh, in the summer of 1997, and one of his first priorities was to work with me to complete this centennial capital campaign, which had been moving rather slowly and needed momentum because of a lack of a current president. Normally, one might have delayed the end date of the campaign, but it was the centennial campaign, so there was no delay <laughs> possible in that uh, end date, because it was the centennial, actually, of both Carnegie Mellon and our country. So we had to work fast. Jerry had just completed a campaign for the college he led at Yale, which I believe was for about $3 million. He was now the president in charge of a $350 million campaign. And just as an aside, yes, the targets were a lot less than what you're dealing with uh, now, David Coulter, and so greatly succeeding. We also had a very small development office at the time, but with the support of the then head of that office, 
Eric Johnson, and his right hand, who is our own today, uh, Pam Eager. They got the two amateurs, Jerry and I, moving ahead on this campaign. It was such a pleasure working with Jerry. His easy demeanor, bright smile, leadership, and interest in people just made him an immediate success stepping into this fire shortened campaign. He actually pulled the campaign through on time, ahead of goal, even with this delayed start, which was an amazing accomplishment. This man was capable of doing really outstanding things. Those of us who had the pleasure of knowing Jerry and working with him will always remember those wonderful human characteristics so exemplified by him. Bonnie, Cindy and my best wishes to you and your family. So sorry for this loss, but you should take solace from the relationship you had with such a wonderful, wonderful man. So with those comments, I would now like to ask you to join in welcoming our next speaker, Mark Hamlet, the Provost Emeritus, at, to the podium at this time. Thank you, Todd. Let me get my notes out here. So I was uh, one of Jerry's deans for three years, and then I was chief academic officer for 13 of his 16 years as president. To fully appreciate the enormity of what Jerry and his presidency meant to the evolution of Carnegie Mellon, it helps to have some context. So I'd like to give a highly condensed feel several of the key strategic directions that helped define Jerry's presidency. The first involved geography. Jerry recognized early on that Carnegie Mellon's fate could not be divorced from Pittsburgh reinventing itself in an extraordinary partnership with Chancellor Nordenberg, as we have heard. They really became among the most important change agents for the entire region and they were remarkably successful. The next is also geographic, namely that Jerry recognized the importance of Carnegie Mellon becoming more international, international campuses and collaborative research centers. One thing for sure, those efforts had a far greater impact on CMU's visibility, not only around the world, but even domestically than we ever anticipated. The third concerns uh, to address the question, how on earth to become a premier world-class research university, competing for faculty and students with Stanford and Princeton and Harvard and all the rest of them, when we were so much less well-known, so much smaller financial resource base? One answer to this question, as David mentioned, was to pursue what might be called selective comparative advantage. And that approach basically summed up to do not try to do everything, but for whatever we do, do it the best in the world. And the other related answer was to use jujitsu by focusing on interdisciplinary niches that we could use our agility and could try to catch the great disciplinary universities back on their heels. Now, believe me, in 1997, no university had followed this path and no universities had demonstrated that it was going to work. But what Jerry's presidency did was something that I think uh, mathematicians would call an existence proof. The only way to show it could be done was to do it. And by 2013, Looking back at Dick Seyert's 18 years as president and Jerry's 16, Carnegie Mellon had been truly transformed. In fact, no research university in the U.S. had come further faster than Carnegie Mellon. 
That's quite an amazing legacy that Jerry is responsible for. And now to cheat just a little bit on my time limit here, uh, uh, I'd like to spend just a moment um, with a comment on Jerry's own personal style and the tone that he set. Uh, indeed, I think for many of us, the most vivid memories of Jerry are not so much those strategies per se, but of Jerry's basic humaneness with all he interacted with. And one aspect of Jerry's style, David sort of alluded to, was a genuine set, a, a sense of humility. And anybody who spent time with him knows what I mean. However, the term humility can be a little bit misleading. It certainly did not equate to reticence or, or diffidence. Well, far from it. Rather, what I saw it more was coming from a certain confidence that Jerry had, a certain comfort in his own skin. And it was demonstrated in many ways. One was the importance that he placed on praising and crediting and celebrating the work of others, even though he may have been well behind the whole projects involved. And another was not needing to show in every encounter that he was the smartest person in the room. He was, he just didn't flaunt it. And he proved that those are traits that can take one very far, that he can take a whole institution very far. It's going to be very much missed. It's my pleasure to ask Martin Rodenberg, Chancellor Rodenberg, to take the podium. Thank you, Mark. And I do want to say it was appropriate for Mark to get recognized earlier uh, because as close as I was to Jerry, uh, I worked an awful lot with Mark uh, and have a sense of what a great impact he had on this university. Uh, the day that Jerry Cohen arrived in Pittsburgh obviously was a great day for CMU. It also was a great day for the region a great day for Pitt, and a great day for me. Uh, I want to begin then by thanking CMU for recruiting Jerry, uh, for supporting him in all of the impactful work that he did, uh, and for bringing us all together today uh, to celebrate the extraordinary life of this amazing man. Of course, when Jerry came to Pittsburgh, he was not flying solo. Uh, instead, he was able to persuade his wonderful wife, Maureen, uh, to put to the side all of the slanderous remarks they had heard about Pittsburgh while growing up in Cleveland, <laughs> and to come along with him. Uh, she did, of course, and she became a force for good in her own right. Uh, and a very special friend to so many of us. And for that, too, we are grateful. Uh, I first heard the name Jerry Cohen in the spring of 1997 while I was attending a meeting of the presidents and chancellors of North America's major research universities. Uh, Judy Roden, at the time the president of Penn, uh, but a colleague of Jerry's from Yale came up to me with excitement and said, Carnegie Mellon is going to make Jerry Cohen its next president, and you, Mark, are going to love working with Jerry. Uh, I sent Jerry some congratulatory flowers and a note indicating that I looked forward to welcoming him when he came to Pittsburgh. Uh, but we were pulled together much earlier than that, uh, because while Jerry was still in New Haven, uh, the two of us were summoned to a high-level meeting at the National Science Foundation, ostensibly to atone for the sins of the 
co-directors of the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. Uh, I don't know whether Michael or Ralph are here, but I should say from the start, uh, there were no sins. Uh, instead, these creative and committed individuals uh, had found a way to commit some resources to the future of the supercomputing center just before the people in Washington were ready to snatch those funds away. Uh, and what they did really became essential to the survival of the computing, supercomputing center. Uh, but the feds had been outsmarted, uh, and they didn't like it. Uh, so there were Jerry and I. Uh, we had never met. Uh, where we, we were being drawn into this less than friendly setting. Uh, but we found that we liked each other. Uh, we complemented each other, uh, and because we were such straight arrows, uh, we actually got kind of a kick out of the fact that our first joint effort had involved beating the rap. <laughs> when Jerry did arrive in Pittsburgh, we immediately made partnering a shared priority driven by three basic beliefs. Uh, the first was that our universities, like the two of us, were highly complementary. Uh, the second was that looking around this country, there was only one neighborhood that had more academic firepower uh, if you considered Pitt and CMU together, and that was Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, and the third was that if we made partnering with each other a priority, uh, we would be positioned both to elevate both universities and also to give our home region a badly needed boost. Uh, and I think that that commitment to partnering and commitment to community probably are the two things for which Jerry and I together uh, became best known. Uh, and with the help of a lot of other people, among other things, the two of us served as the founding co-chairs of such initiatives as the Pittsburgh Digital Greenhouse, Life Sciences Greenhouse, and Robotics Foundry. Uh, we supported the creation of teams involving faculty members from both universities who competed successfully uh, for national research centers coming to Pittsburgh, something that neither institution could have done alone. Uh, we named a single vice president to head the economic development initiatives for both universities, which was another way of enforcing this desire to get things done together. And at a time when job creation was absolutely essential uh, to climbing out of what was a pretty deep hole, uh, the only sector of our economy uh, that regularly produced significant job growth year after year after year was education and healthcare, uh, driven principally by CMU, Pitt, and UPMC. In the aftermath of the deadly attack at the Tree of Life Synagogue on October 27, 2018, uh, our partnership took a new form as Jerry and I both became actively involved in anti-hate work. Uh, we first served on a special committee uh, formed by the Jewish Federation uh, and led with an extraordinary touch by David Shapira. With the encouragement of our successors, Farnham and Chancellor Gallagher, uh, we laid the foundation for the Collaboratory Against Hate, a joint CMU Pitt research initiative, now led in part by Mark Hamlin. And we also joined forces with the talented and tireless Laura Ellsworth to launch the Eradicate Hate Global Summit, 
uh, in an effort already largely successful uh, to create the biggest and best anti-hate initiative right here in Pittsburgh. The passage of time uh, confirmed that early prediction offered to me by Judy Roden uh, that I was going to love working with Jerry Cohen. But the passage of time also suggested that she could have eliminated two words from that prediction because over time, like David, I simply came to love Jerry Cohen, who over the course of our more than quarter century of partnering and uh, supporting each other, unfailingly modeled the best of what it means to be a committed partner and a caring friend. It was a great blessing to me to have this amazing person in my life in so many important ways for such a long period of time. Uh, and I will be forever grateful for that. Please join me now in viewing a special message from our next speaker, Esther Bush, the former president and CEO of the Urban League of Greater Pittsburgh. Pleased to work with Jerry as a member of the Urban League's Board of Directors. As CMU's president, Jerry Cohen personally took on the role as head of CMU's first diversity committee. Under Jerry's leadership, Carnegie Mellon University hosted the Urban League State of Black Pittsburgh's annual meeting for several years. Following his retirement from the Urban League of Greater Pittsburgh Board of Directors, we were delighted to bestow upon him the Ronald H. Brown Leadership Award to acknowledge his services to the African American community. Jerry also made an extraordinary legacy gift to the black community and thereby the entire greater Pittsburgh community when he introduced his daughter to the Urban League of Greater Pittsburgh Charter School. This was the beginning of Hallie's work with our African-American youth, first through the Charter School Theater Program and then through the life-changing Alumni Theater Company in its own right, offering creative pathways to our black youth to this day. Jerry was a devoted husband and wise leader he is sorely missed and will always be remembered. I trust his efforts are continuing with the angels. Hi everyone, I'm Mary Jo Dively. I'm the general counsel here. Um, I had the great privilege of working with Jerry for 11 years on a daily basis, and I'm, I'm honored to be able to offer just a few thoughts about this truly great man and friend. Of course, no amount of words can do justice to him or convey our sorrow that Bunny and Hallie and Josh and Solomon and Nathan did not have more time together. but. Nathan and Solomon, I look at you and I see your grandfather and am so grateful for that. So let me say just a bit right now of, of what's in my heart. Um, first, like Mark said, um, I've never known anyone who was as comfortable in his skin as Jerry Cohen um, or in doing what he felt to be the right thing, no matter the personal cost to him. You know, he typically started our frequent conversations about legal issues with one question, what's the right thing to do here, Mary Jo? Not what's the expedient thing, what's the least risky thing, what can we get away with, but what's the right thing? Um, 
Indeed, there were times when he said to me, legal consequences be damned, Mary Jo. Uh, there's a principle here we have to stand up for. Um, he knew who he was and what he thought. And for a lawyer, he was just a dream client. Um, he, as others have said, Jerry believed in the power of education to build bridges. And he was passionate about taking Carnegie Mellon all over the world, even to places which, at times, some found questionable. The decision to open a campus in Qatar, uh, taken within a year after the September 11th tragedy, uh, was one such example. Jerry understood the power of a university then led by a Jewish president and provost deciding to partner with an Islamic nation which was itself seeking to build bridges to the West um, at such a pivotal time. His approach was not one of, oh, here's this acclaimed Western university coming to tell you what's what and how things should be done, but rather, how can we learn from one another? That's how he approached almost everything. Um, he embraced the complexity of the world, something he was well suited to do because he was a deeply educated and philosophical man, but even more importantly, because he was at heart a hopeful man, a man who uh, was a realist but never a cynic. Um, he hired me as the first general counsel at Carnegie Mellon back in 2002, and he changed my life. I remember that when I was first going out, coming out here, going out there, co coming out here to meet him, to talk about the job, uh, a fr uh, I had never met him before. And a friend called me and said, well, you better make sure you want that job before you talk to him because he's the most persuasive man in the world. Um, and uh, in fact, he was. Um, not in that obvious hard sell, you know, hot box you kind of way. I was well used to that from other lawyers. But rather by listening deeply and asking just a few questions that just somehow seemed to unlock for you what the path should be for you. Um, and that's what he did with me. And, and by the way, that was typically the path he wanted you to choose. Um, and on that day, you know, he saw something in me that I had not figured out for myself yet, which was that I would value the deep joy that comes from uh, a mission-driven career on behalf of a world-changing institution. Um, and he asked me those questions, which led me to that conclusion. Um, and I thank God he did every day, because this has been the greatest professional experience of my life. But he also changed the lives of our three sons because today they're proud graduates of Carnegie Mellon and would not have been without Jerry Cohen, I suspect. Um, a little clue into how he would approach things. One day I, I had a particularly vexing personal problem that uh, had nothing to do with Carnegie Mellon, but I, you know, I went to him because I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do and I gave him the facts and I said, you know, Jerry, what should I do here? What, should, what would you do here? And he said, well, Mary Jo, I, I, I won't tell you what I would do because that might not be right for you. Which was so humble, always, you know. Um, but he said, I I'll tell you how I approach these things and maybe that'll help you. And he said, what I typically do is I imagine myself like a year down the road and I think, how will I look back on this decision? Will I be proud of it? Will I be embarrassed by it, happy with it? And then usually that helps me figure it out. And so I followed that advice and honestly, quickly was able to make a decision. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've followed that advice since. Um, so every speaker today could talk for hours about Jerry, um, about his leadership, his character, his friendship, the indelible mark he left on Carnegie Mellon, on Pittsburgh, on all of us. Um, but um, we did agree to keep our remarks brief, and we are trying, um, in order to allow more to speak. And so um, I'll close now as I started by saying that Bunny and Hallie and Josh and Solomon and Nathan should have had so much more time with him, and I wish that he was here with us right now because I loved that man, and I will be forever grateful to him and indebted to him. So now if you join me, we're going to hear from a few other friends and colleagues by video. Thank you. The time, 1996. Me, a transplant from a large university system, 
planning my way as newly minted head of a prestigious department at Carnegie Mellon Psychology. For some reason, I was appointed to the presidential search committee that hired Jerry Cohen. I was very keen to learn what real administrators were like. Even in that first interview, I knew that Jerry was the kind of leader we needed. Someone who would help make our audacious and far-reaching agendas a reality. I thank Jerry for giving me insight into the often unremarked but absolutely essential human qualities that foster the brilliant work of a great university. Jared is, was, a quintessential American citizen, trustworthy, friendly, and approachable, respectful of people and their space, discreet and supportive of the community, a grounded, gifted, and inspirational leader who led without ego. The commitment to diversity as a core value for Carnegie Mellon University and enhancing diversity has been one of Carnegie Mellon's top priorities. Jerry took on the leadership role for the implementation of this initiative shortly after his arrival at Carnegie Mellon in 1997 by making diversity a key element of his first strategic plan. To ensure ongoing attention to this issue, he established a diversity advisory council, which was tasked with defining the problems and challenges of diversity at Carnegie Mellon. This striving for diversity and inclusion helped make Carnegie Mellon a special place for our students, faculty, and staff to live, learn, work, and play. It was my honor to be his co-chair, or as he called me, his secretariat. With much fondness, I recall how dedicated he was to the President's Diversity Advisory Council. Jerry would not delegate this responsibility and made sure that he was personally present to chair each of our meetings. Jerry understood that diversity cannot be taught, that it must be experienced. He got it and dispersed the word. I love him for this. Jerry made us better. My Jerry Cohen golf story. I'm sure there are probably some eyes rolling in the audience right now because many have heard this story over the years. But the quick story is, my husband and I had just taken up golf, and on a late Sunday in August of 1997, we decided to go to the Shenley Golf Course. After the second hole, we caught up with a couple that was playing ahead of us. The husband had just gone back to the clubhouse to get his wife a drink, and the wife asked if we would be interested in golfing with them. She mentioned that they were new to Pittsburgh and introduced herself as Maureen, and her husband was Jerry, the new president of Carnegie Mellon. Of course, we were thrilled to golf with them. The following week, we went back to practice, and Jerry came running after us, asking if he could golf with us again. A funny part of the story is that Jerry was making rounds in every school's faculty meeting, and he walked into one of mine and said, Hi, Kristen. And the faculty all turned and looked at me, a young faculty member, and said, How do you know the new president already? And Jerry chimes in, Oh, we golf together. <laughs> Years later, I told Jerry that one of my claims to fame is my Jerry Cohen golf story, and to which Jerry laughingly replied, Kristen, if that's your claim to fame, you lead a really sad life. <laughs> Jerry, thanks for letting me tell the story once more, and hopefully you're somewhere either rolling your eyes or laughing with us. I am so delighted that we can be together to celebrate this truly great man's life. I want to focus on just one thing today, and that is Jerry Cohen, the warrior. A gentleman and a scholar indeed. Kind, nice, just a good egg. But make no mistake, a warrior, when it came to any individual or any group of individuals who did not get the respect they deserved. People who were treated by anyone, and especially by those of power and privilege, as being less than. Jerry was the champion of all those who needed a champion most. He did so with empathy, with grace, and with the fierce determination to bestow his own power and privilege on others. For the sake of justice, yes, while also so that this world could simply be a better place. And so it is a better place. Your world, our world, indeed, Jerry Cohen's world. Thank you, Jerry. I love you, and I love the legacy that you have left behind for all of us. The classiest thing I've ever seen was something President Cohen did on Monday evening, May 22nd, 2000. During the 1999-2000 academic year, 
he had led a process to adopt domestic partner benefits as an option for all CMU employees, which required a formal vote in favor by the trustees. He asked an ad hoc coalition of staff, students, and faculty to help him by pushing him publicly on the issue, all leading up to that vote at the trustee meeting on May 22nd. That evening, a group of LGBTQ folks and allies went for a celebratory drink at a gay bar in Shadyside. And in walked Jerry Cohen, still in his trademark double-breasted suit. Thank you, thank you, let us buy you a drink, President Cohen. He replied, call me Jerry, and I'm the one here to thank you. The drinks are on me. What a kind, strong, humble, and classy leader. Godspeed, Jerry. I'm the director of the Scott Institute for Energy Innovation and a professor of civil and environmental engineering. These are also two of the positions that Jerry held after he transformed the university as our eighth president. Like many others in the Carnegie Mellon community, Jerry was my mentor and my friend. His door was always open to all of us, and the impact he had on students, staff, and faculty is part of his great legacy. Jerry lived and breathed the Carnegie Mellon ethos, that we can think across systems and work together across boundaries to solve the world's biggest challenges. He helped create the Scott Institute because he believed that Carnegie Mellon energy innovations could make the future better for everybody. As usual, Jerry was right. Those were an extremely touching set of uh, sentiments. Uh, let's give another round of applause uh, to everyone who contributed to those wonderful set of video. As I think uh, you all can tell from uh, what's been said already by the many excellent speakers to this point, that uh, university presidents uh, can be incredibly consequential. President, company included. And Jerry certainly was. He helped to define Carnegie Mellon University as this amazing institution that we uh, currently enjoy. He shaped our, helped shape our culture and affect how we think about ourselves as Tartans. Jerry often called himself an accidental president. He said that being president of CMU was not originally part of his plan. And yet, he so intentionally moved us toward being a more diverse, global, and innovative organization, as you've heard described in so many ways to this point. Like me, Jerry was a member of our engineering faculty. In fact, he was, uh, in, in fact, when he was president, I, I was head of the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department, and as an illustration of uh, Jerry's uh, humble style has been so talked about, he would joke that I was actually his boss. <laughs> CMU engineers are very proud to call Jerry one of their own, and he cherished his time as a member of our faculty, uh, especially in the classroom, as, that has, as has been talked about uh, a number of times so far, and he enjoyed that so much that after his presidency, he returned to the classroom for another decade. Jerry was also a leader in his field, a recognized leader. He was uh, uh, honored as a distinguished member of the American Society of Civil Engineers, the highest honor that that group bestows. And he's also a very beloved and highly regarded member, was a highly regarded member of the National Academy of Engineers. Jerry brought humanity to his work and to his role as a leader. He affected how uh, we prioritize diversity, as others have mentioned, and he planted an important seed that continues to blossom here at CMU. As the leader of this institution, Jerry knew that to be excellent meant that we must be inclusive, 
And he centered this perspective throughout his own work and encouraged the university to embrace that mindset. As Mary Jo so uh, you know, eloquently stated, he knew what to say in tough moments and wasn't afraid to tackle challenging situations. In short, he brought heart to CMU. Cherry was a mentor and a role model to many and including me. Near the end of his presidency, uh, his colleagues encouraged him to write down some of the lessons instilled during his tenure as president. His memoir entitled Riding the Rocket Ship is being published by the CMU Press and will be available in the coming months and I hope you all have a chance to read it. Thank you for the chance given to me to pay tribute to my friend and colleague, uh, to his family. You have my deepest uh, condolences for your loss. Uh, we uh, all appreciate the time you shared, uh, Jerry, with us. Uh, I know I speak for all of us in this room. We will certainly miss him and uh, do appreciate the enormous impact that he has had on CMU. So now it is my pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Alex Weibel from the School of Computer Science to the stage. Thank you. Maureen, Holly, it's just a real honor for me as a lowly faculty member to say a few remarks of how Jerry has impacted my life. Farnham, thank you very much for inviting me to and for organizing this. It's a real privilege to have met uh, Farnham and to, uh, to uh, Jerry and to have worked with him because we, I work, as some of you know, partially in Germany at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, which is one of the large uh, universities in Germany. And Jerry was instrumental in signing the cooperation that we had with Karlsruhe University at the time and uh, befriended the president of Karlsruhe University, uh, uh, Horst Tippler, who uh, became a kind of a collaborator on another part of the world and instrumented really his international outreach that represents really Jerry's work over the, over the time that he was with us. Uh, and I want to share a few funny moments because one of the things that uh, Jerry was wonderful at is he combined brilliance with wit and humor and made everything more lighthearted and uh, any kind of potential conflicts and complications did very disarming. So when, we, when he visited first at Karlsruhe, uh, he met uh, President Horst Hippler and we had various meetings. He recognized the students of our cooperation. He honored them uh, most charmingly and graciously. And, um, but he was also impressed with all the titles that the Germans love. You know, everybody was doctor, professor, doctor, and department heads are spectabilität, and presidents are magnificence, and so on. So returning to Pittsburgh, he took me by the side and seriously looked me in the eye and says, I will demand that you now, from now on, call me magnificence. <laughs> For a moment, I wasn't sure if he was serious. <laughs> but... It continued, the collaboration and the friendship grew, and eventually uh, Karlsruhe University joined with the Forschungszentrum uh, Karlsruhe, which is one of the large uh, um, national laboratories, uh, to form a merger, the so-called Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, KIT. It was a gigantic merger. They had to change the law in Germany to do that because it's a national lab with a state university, and so on and so on. Jerry became an advisor and helped Horst Tippler to push this through and make it happen. And when uh, the delegation with the minister visited he us here at CMU, we had this meeting in which Horst Tippler explained the concept of Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, KIT, and uh, Jerry uh, so pointingly remarked, and I'm sure you chose the name KIT because it rhymes so well with CMU. <laughs> 
many more stories like this, but the third one I will share, we then organized a presidential summit in Silicon Valley, where we invited presidents of our growing network of eight universities, and they all flew in. It was a daunting task of organizing all of these uh, dignitaries coming in, plus dignitaries from Silicon Valley and so on. Many speeches, many notable participants, and this uh, me, lowly young faculty member, of course, I miss acknowledging or uh, or thanking someone, etc. Jerry wouldn't take over. He would just take me by the side. Mm, you forgot to recognize so and so. You should say thank you to this and this and such and such. So he wasn't taking over. He was tutoring me, and I got, I got to learn from him how one of the most important things he always impressed: be gracious, Alex. Be gracious, and uh, to me that still has an impact to to this day, and I will never remember, never forget that. So um, Jerry passed on March 16. His colleague and uh, collaborator, Horst Tibler, the president of KIT, pars passed this year on March 6, just 10 days before Jerry passed. Two wonderful friends who worked towards an international collaboration and bringing the world closer in friendship and in, uh, in this joint endeavor of science and education. Jerry leaves a unforgettable legacy. He was not only brilliant, he was a masterful leader who knew that science is a human endeavor, and I will never forget his warmth and his generosity. Thank you. So with this, let me pass on to the next speaker. We now please join me to welcome Betty M. Bohm, a Mellon College of Science 2008 graduate who will provide us with a pre-recorded message. And following Betty, John Surma, retired chairman and CEO of U.S. Steel Corporation, will speak from the podium. Thank you very much. I got to know Dr. Cohen during my undergraduate years at Carnegie Mellon, specifically my junior and senior years, when I was launching an undergraduate program for underrepresented minorities in STEM called COMPASS. Dr. Cohen was very passionate about diversity in higher education and extremely thoughtful when he engaged on this topic. What I remember most and what surprised me about him was the fact that as an undergraduate, I would email him, the president of the university, and he would usually get back to me within 24 hours. And whenever we would meet, he would always give me his undivided attention. He had this unique ability to make you feel like you were saying, the most important thing he had heard that day. He truly cared about students and wanted to ensure that we felt heard. I remember in the early days of Compass, he was so supportive of the initiative and so invested in its success. His level of thoughtfulness was unparalleled and he possessed such unique leadership qualities that have stuck with me till this day. In most professional settings, I rarely encounter other people that look like me, and I've never questioned whether or not I belong in those rooms or at those tables. That's because of the interactions and relationships that I was able to have so early in my development with people like Dr. Cohen, who were so senior in their career, yet so approachable and so humble. He made a black, female undergraduate biology major feel heard, feel seen, and most importantly, feel empowered. He was truly one of a kind and will be greatly missed. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and Bunny and family for the opportunity to help celebrate the extraordinary life of my good friend, who I find that I miss terribly, and in fact, I seem to miss him more with each passing day. I still speak to him regularly, usually early in the morning, which is when we did our most important work on things that neither of us could ever remember. Uh, our long and close friendship spanned both uh, business and 
personal activities. We work closely on a wide variety of board assignments, including with uh, Mr. Shapira and the Chancellor uh, going way back. Uh, both commercial activities, civic activities, every possible kind of board. And, and uh, I particularly speak today, though, for the uh, directors and executives present and past of uh, Train Technologies, where Jerry served for 25 years and where his leadership and vision, including as the company's first technology and innovation committee chairman, still guides our thinking today. Now, Jerry's athletic accomplishments have already been hinted at, uh, but they're less well known, perhaps, than his other activities. Uh, they took place largely at the Laurel Valley Golf Club or other similar locations. Uh, he was and is uh, beloved by the staff uh, and caddies and others from Laurel Valley who still talk about the doctor, as he was affectionately known. They observe that there are lots of doctors who are members, but he's the only one that they refer to as the doctor. Uh, I think they all admired him for his wonderful sense of humor, which given our golf accomplishments was required. Uh, but as has been noted by others, I think for his great sense of humanity. Uh, I'm going to close and stay on my time assignment by reading a brief message I submitted to the university's uh, remembrance page that was referred to earlier some time ago. Uh, I read it at our last Train Technologies board meeting in Ireland several months ago. Here goes. We met at a golf event at Laurel Valley in 2001, a scene of many enjoyable days spent together in maddening frustration on the golf course, but in close enjoyment of our deep and abiding friendship. We served together at every possible opportunity, including on the boards of Mellon Financial, the Allegheny Conference, Ingersoll Rand, and Train Technologies. In the latter case, our board trips to Ireland afforded many opportunities for lengthy and enjoyable discussions, occasionally golf, and a variety of culinary adventures. Uh, Jerry was gracious to invite me to visit with the Carnegie Mellon classes that he conducted after retiring as president, always preceded by a lunch at the Chengdu Gourmet on Forward Avenue. And we would arrive at the class in various stages of stains and smells, but we wouldn't miss it for the world. And Becky and I were privileged to enjoy Jerry's significant barbecue talents on many occasions, ably assisted, of course, by First Officer Bunny. Now I'm wondering who I will spend a Sunday afternoon with at Laurel Valley. Or will I ever have another lunch at the Chengdu Gourmet? He was a friend for life. He was the friend of my lifetime. Thank you. Uh, please join me now in welcoming Mr. Dan Shear to the podium, Jerry's first PhD student at Johns Hopkins. Before I start, it occurs to me that uh, you've had Jerry here at CMU as president, but my fellow doggy students, I'll explain that in a minute, um, had him first. Uh, and we had his full attention. And I wanted to give you a feel for what it was like to be his student where you really did have a whole lot of his full attention for a long time. It was pretty spectacular. So, about 51 years ago, really was that long, this new PhD student 
fresh from MIT, walked into a bar. No. <laughs> he walked into the Department of Geography and Environmental Engineering at the Johns Hopkins University. He was a new assistant professor. We, uh, he was a new assistant professor. At that time, Doggy was one of the most highly ranked um, environmental engineering programs in the country, so he had a lot of pressure on him from the department to perform, and he was replacing the great John Liebman, so he had really big shoes to fill. But it was Jerry. Of course he was up to it. Jerry and his tenure as a professor at Doggy, Department of Geography and Environmental Engineering, and as a dean at the Johns Hopkins University, influenced so many students, faculty, other colleagues, all of whom, well, most of whom, the great majority, realized just how lucky they were to have benefited from his help and from his example. Now, I was Jerry's first student, and I was Jerry's first problem. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. I had finished, about finished my dissertation research. My major professor was busy with earlier students, and Jerry, lucky for me, took me in. My problem, and Jerry's problem thus, was that I really hate to write. But Jerry, Jerry was a mensch, as you have said. And menches somehow know how to figure out exactly what to do next. That's the best thing to do next. So Jerry was also a multi-objective analyst. That was his work at MIT. So he analyzed me. He looked at what I needed, how I could be encouraged to do things. He had objectives, one of which was to get me the hell out of there, the second of which was to teach me how to figure out what to do next, as you've heard from others before tonight. So I wrote my thesis next by next. I finished. It was a miracle. A miracle. Ask my wife. Did he? Jerry's mission was to help others. Uh, it didn't matter if you showed up in his office at 5 a.m., because he was there at 5 a.m., and we could show up at 5 a.m. Not me, but we could. If you needed help, as was said earlier, you got his full attention. Uh, uh, a deed that that helps others is called a mitzvah. To a mitzvah, get a blessing, not the least of which is knowing that you have done something that was worth doing. And Jerry did mitzvahs continuously. He helped people solve problems. He used his engineering skills, his multi-objective analytical skills, his social skills, and his ingenuity, and anyone else and anything else that he could glom onto to get to solutions. And that, to us, I think, was Jerry's essence. He taught that essence. One of the most important courses that his students took, many of his students took, was applications of operations research. It taught applying operations research to real-world problems by using, guess what, real-world examples. He taught OR as art. He knew that solving problems in the real world was an art, and he taught it that way. Cherry was always happy when he was being useful. He inspired others to be useful. Most important to his students, of course, was that he was our mentor. And mentors teach you stuff. More important, 
Mentors teach you how to do stuff, how to be useful. Jerry took great joy in the accomplishments of his students. I know this because he called me several times. He knew that he had helped us to help others by mentoring. He knew that you passed on value to others by what you teach, and he taught. In closing, I'd like to quote from the Kaddish, the Jewish prayer for the dead. The departed, who we now remember, still live on earth in the acts of goodness they performed and in the hearts of those who cherish their memory. My fellow doggy students, colleagues, and I will keep Jerry alive. We tell stories about what he did, how great it was, and how he did it. But we also pass on his teachings to our colleagues by mentoring our students, our children, and our grandchildren. So please, join me. Join me in a commitment to Jerry. Join me by shouting, tear and I perhaps, but joyously, for Jerry has bestowed so many great gifts. Long live Jerry Cohen. Long live Jerry Cohen. What the fuck are you talking about? I can't get the other one. 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 Jerry Cohen's, uh, John Ho Johns Hopkins um, colleagues. And again, thank you to all of our remarkable speakers who have shared so many wonderful memories um, with us um, this afternoon, this evening. You know, I, um, before, <coughs> excuse me, before I introduce our last speaker this afternoon, I want to go off script and share a couple of thoughts with you. Jerry would tell you that the presidents get to go off script and not stay within that allocated time. Um, you know, earlier this evening, I, this afternoon, I shared with you the perspective on Jerry's legacy and impact on Carnegie Mellon and our region, and you heard from many of our friends and colleagues and collaborators about that impact. But I figured, as I was thinking about it last night, that I should um, give you my perspective as someone who has the honor of leading this great institution that Jerry and his predecessors built with the help of many of you in this room. I met Jerry in 2014, first, of course, as provost and then as president. And I'll be really brief. Um, in my role as president, I would call Jerry regularly and speak with him, whether it was at events like this or by phone, about issues that faced the university. And what was the head for the university? Great things, challenges, opportunities, and so on. First of all, he always took my call. Uh, he was always there. I felt supported. And I felt his kindness over the years. I felt like Jerry had my back. Ironically, I was on a flight with one of our colleagues coming back from Qatar, visiting our campus in March, when, yeah, I, I never cut off connections on the, from the network. So I got this text message learning that uh, Jerry had passed away on that Saturday. And I was mentioned that I was coming back from the campus that he built. Suddenly, I have to tell you, the job felt tougher. 
the weight seemed much heavier, and the world felt lonelier. And I think this is what you heard many of our friends, colleagues, and of course the family members feel. I also want to share with you that since Jerry's passing, in recognition of his enduring legacy at Carnegie Mellon, a number of loving friends and family members and supporters have contributed funds in his honor. To everyone who contributed, thank you on behalf of the university community for honoring Jerry's legacy. Uh, these memorial contributions together with additional investments that the university will make uh, will help us establish Dr. Jerry Cohen Memorial Fund at Carnegie Mellon, which will, will provide support for areas and disciplines that were close to Jerry's heart. Of course, we'll work with the family uh, to direct these funds at the appropriate time. But I should also tell you that CMU already benefited from philanthropy of Jerry and Bunny and their friends and alumni and university colleagues during their Jerry's tenure here and established several funds to support remarkable scholars in our community. As you heard, Jerry was passionate about our students. This occurs through undergraduate scholarships and a graduate fellowship in civil engineering. Um, several dozen students have already benefited from the support that these funds provide. We, of course, look forward to extending this legacy with this newly established memorial fund in honor of Jerry. Our last and final speaker this evening is someone who probably knows Jerry better than most of us in this room. Hallie Donner is Jerry and Bunny's daughter. She's here today with us, as I mentioned, with Josh and their two sons, Solomon and Nathan. Hallie is not just a tartan by association. She's also an alumna of CMU, having obtained her master's in arts management in 2000. I should also note that Josh also earned his bachelor's and master's degree from CMU. Solomon, Nathan, let me tell you that Provost Garrett is looking forward to receiving your applications for admission to Carnegie Mellon at the right time. Everyone, please join me in extending a warm welcome to Hallie Donner. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today to celebrate my dad. I thought that I would use my time just to say some brief thank yous. I thought everybody would appreciate the brief at this stage. Um, I want to first thank Carnegie Mellon University, not only for a wonderful event today, but for being so important in the lives of my whole family. When my dad became president at Carnegie Mellon, it was a family affair. My mom was welcomed and cared for immediately and still is to this day his partner in all things. Um, Josh and I met as, as grad students at the Heinz School, so we have Carnegie Mellon to thank for that. Our sons were interrupting important meetings in the president's office with their visits and running around at the university holiday party for every year. Needless to say, we have many wonderful memories of this fabulous institution, and we are really, really grateful for all of them. I would like to um, specifically thank the people who organized today's event, um, most especially Pam and Michael and Jennifer, and of course, Farnham. Thank you so much for making space for us to honor my father in this way. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I wanted to thank everybody, which is probably almost everybody in this room, who walked alongside my father during his amazing career, all of his students and colleagues. He was a great man, and he was great because of each of you. And please hold that with pride. And it is, of course, it has been extremely difficult for my family to have lost my father. He was as you can imagine, such an unbelievable husband, father, and grandfather, just as great as you would think he would be from all the other things that you've heard today. Um, but knowing 
that his legacy will live on not only in us, but in all of you is of tremendous comfort. So thank you so much for the role that you played in his life. We are so appreciative. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Bunny, Ali, Josh, and all of your family members and loved ones who are here with us today, we recognize that this experience must be at once heartbreaking and heartwarming. And on behalf of your extended family here at Carnegie Mellon, I just want to thank you again for being here and also for giving us the opportunity to bring our community together to honor Jerry. And everyone, thank you for joining us as we remembered and celebrated Carnegie Mellon's beloved eighth president and our friend, Dr. Jerry Cohen. This concludes. <laughs> this concludes our formal speaking portion of our program, and I'm pleased to invite everyone who is able to, to stay and connect during the reception. The reception is going to be right outside this room in McKenna, Peter, and Wright rooms nearby. Thank you, and may Jerry's memory be a blessing. Thank you for being here.